Hi everyone, I'm Karin Barrar. I'm an actor and director, and today I have the extraordinary opportunity of talking to one of my really good friends, but also a phenomenal filmmaker, Rima Maya, about her new short film, Nocturnal Burger. Rima, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to talk to you about just all things Nocturnal Burger. So I love this film. I have shared it with a bunch of my friends, but for people who haven't seen the film yet, could you tell us a little bit about it and how this story kind of came to you? So Nocturnal Burger is a 28 minute long short and uh, it talks about what happens one night when a 13 year old girl and a 30 something man are brought to a dysfunctional police station in the middle of the night in Mumbai. And then through a series of unreliable narrators, we try to piece together what did or didn't happen that night or could have happened that night. And it really is an exploration of um, abuse, trauma and its manifestations. We're talking about um, just how prevalent and omnipresent uh, things, incidences of child sexual abuse are. And uh, we're really looking at it from the perspective of the thread of empathy that ties the victims together and the systemic inadequacies that uh, ultimately make us fail our children and our women. But um, the story actually started from a very unfortunate real incident a few years ago where I was coming back home and uh, it was around 12.30 at night and there was a rickshaw that uh, happened to pass by us. And I happened to look from the corner of my eye and it looked like there was a couple making out in the back. So I didn't you know, pay it any attention. We went a little ahead and that rickshaw crossed us again. And this time, in a split second, I... I saw that it wasn't a couple. It was like a kid and a man. Mm. And this girl was just frozen in as far into the corner of the rickshaw as she could be. And he was, you know, sort of imposing himself on her. And it was it was such a shocking moment. And it was also just you you have a fraction of a second to be very sure that this is what you saw. And then yeah. you have a fraction of a second to decide what do you actually do about it. So, of course, we, you know, pulled our cab in front of the rickshaw, stopped them, grabbed, uh, I just put the girl behind me. Uh, a few people came in, they helped, they grabbed the guy. And thankfully, we were very close to a police station. So we could wrangle him there. And then a lot happened that night. But uh, Nocturnal Burger is inspired from that real incident. And then, of course, it's, heavily fictionalized but yeah that that night was, was a very heavy night and it stayed with me for many years you know it, it was one of those things that um you it it impacts you so deeply that you don't even talk about it and then it you see all the different ways in which it finds a release out of you so I think Nocturnal which, Burger was that release. Which leads me to my next question I think as someone who, who knows you pretty well I know about the, you know, how rich your life is with with stories and, you know, yeah, these these very deep and rich experiences. Uh, I've I've noticed, and especially as a multi hyphenate, I'm curious to get your experience with this. When it comes to writing something like this, was it a story that was like bursting out of you and you just like pen to paper, or you immediately hit the ground running in terms of like I need to get it out there, or was it kind of sheltered in a corner of your mind? And then you had to slowly pry it out to kind of not only process that moment, but kind of, you know, uh, you know, walk yourself through everything that had just happened. I think I was sort of on a on a subconscious level resisting, you know, actually sitting down and putting it out because you know that you have to confront so many of your demons. You have to, you know, a lot is going to start coming out when you start unraveling something like this. Um, and but when it started and when I actually started writing, um, it just it didn't stop flowing. I remember it was Raksha Bandhan, which is this Indian festival where, you know, it, the brothers come over and the sisters tie them Raksis, which was actually very interesting because when you tie up your brother Raksi, the promise he makes is that I'll always protect you. So it was we were celebrating Raksha Bandhan and all my cousins and all my mother's cousins, everybody was in the house and there was the celebration happening and I'm sitting in one corner just like writing away the script to this to this film um, and I think the writing process was interesting because 
the first layer of writing, I wanted to make sure that I completely dissociate myself from it. It's really, I mean, there is an inciting incident and there are reasons why it's important to say the story, but I did not want it to be like, oh, this is my perspective of what happened that night at all. I wanted it to be bigger than that. And I wanted it to be, uh, to talk about a lot more things and a lot more themes and a lot more uh, observations of life than just what I felt that night. Um, so that was the first step of it. And then there's a really lovely filmmaker called Devashish Makhija, who uh, I'd sent him the first draft of the script. And again, he was like, we all already know that child sexual abuse is wrong. So how do we challenge ourselves from a craft perspective? So uh, we really did try uh, to write multiple characters and, and chart multiple graphs within the canvas of a short film, which is a little challenging. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. I think, especially in my rewatches, I, I've gotten so immersed in into this the, the world of this story, which unfortunately is a very real world that exists today. It's a world we live in. But I find that there's there's these four women that I've been focused on, you know, uh, and the uh, our, our savior, our victim, the mother and the officer. And you pick up on all their very um, deep and rich lives and everything that's kind of happening outside of this police station. I guess for you, when I'm watching it as a viewer, I don't feel like you're shoving in a bunch of information. It feels very seamless and flowing and like a very, like, um, you know, you're breathing in this moment. How were you able to create these four individual lives with your writing style without making the script feeling cluttered? I think one of the main things that we really wanted to do was make sure that the audience is also an active participant. And that's because that's that's reality, right? When something like this happens and there is a, a an investigation that has to be put together, no one's going to come and tell you this is what it is. You'll see different perspectives and then you have to piece the information together. And also you have to rely on your own ability to judge these people uh, to suss them out, to understand whether you believe everything they're saying or not, and then piece the the entire thing together. But even then, it'll be your subjective um, understanding or investigation of it because it's informed and colored by everything that's happened in your life up to that point. And uh, we really, during both during the writing and during the editing, wanted to make sure that there is space for the audience to also be an active participant in the investigation. And it's been really interesting to observe different people's watching experiences and who they choose to believe and who they choose to not believe. Um, with respect to why multiple characters, I think especially with the three main women, Minu, who's a little girl who just went through the experience and is brought to the police station, uh, Simi, the woman who brings her to the police station, and Trupti, uh, Sarita's character who went to, who's the police constable. Um, it was really about, again, exploring three different kinds of manifestations of trauma. So with Minu, mm -hmm. you look at the immediate consequences of trauma with something that has just happened. With Simi, you look at the long-term manifestations of trauma, something that has happened 20 years ago. How does it still continue to haunt your life on a daily basis? And with uh, Sarita, the constable's character, we're talking about when you're chronically an everyday level for a long period of time in a state of being abused, how does that change you? And how does that almost make you forget your sense of empathy uh, in a way that you almost take on certain traits of your abuser. So, um, and then what does it take to undo that damage as well? So for me, I think that was uh, really important to look at the idea of abuse and look at it from a, a lens of time. Yeah, I, I think that when the, you know, you, you were being so thoughtful with, with the script writing process, I I'm curious about how that also uh, you know translated over to your uh, directing choices. There was you know uh, I, there's these beautiful moments of you know our you, it's it's the the frame slowing down um, through you know our young character's perspective or you know certain creative choices that 
because you you feel immersed in this world, but also you do get lost into the minds of these characters through your directing choices. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit? Yes. So one of the first decisions that I made when I decided that this is the film that we want to make um, was that we're not going to depict any abuse at all. We're not going to show it and we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to describe it because I wanted to be very sure that even involuntarily, we don't end up fetishizing something that we're trying to critique. Um, yeah. And that was, and of course, you don't want to re-traumatize anybody because, oh my God, just growing up, in India, and I'm sure in a lot of other parts of the world, but I, I look around me and there's barely anybody who hasn't experienced some form of uh, sexual abuse in their childhood. And this is, you know, friends, girls or boys. This is uh, people of the generations that come before us. It's been so pervasive and it's been something that is just not spoken about at all. So uh, I wanted to be very sensitive to the audiences and to my my cast and crew members to make sure that they are not feeling re-traumatized by anything. And we wanted to be very sure that we're as protective of our young cast members as possible. So uh, they were, of course, never put into a physically uncomfortable situation, but they were also not really told what is actually happening. So the direction cues that I gave them was completely different, very, you know, in their world sort of, a, oh, your dad doesn't want, your father doesn't want you to go play with your, with your friends and you're not happy about it. And, you know, cues like that, but, Oh, there's a really interesting anecdote about uh, about this. So Minu's character is played by Bebo, uh, who is this lovely girl. I found her taking a stroll under my aunt's building in Mira Road uh, because she just happened to have recently moved there with her family. And the moment I saw her, that that was it. I didn't I didn't audition anybody else. She was Minu right from the beginning and this was the first time like she's not an actor she's had no acting experience she's never been in front of a camera so um it but there was just something in her that was extremely professional and yeah. she was so dedicated she was so focused she just had this this focus that you know I just have to listen to what Reema Didi is saying and do exactly that and there would be Reema moments Didi. Oh, oh my god <laughs> <laughs> the good old days of of, of calling someone uh, Didi. <laughs> Didi, yeah. So Didi, Didi means sister, uh, yeah. older sister in India. And uh, so I would, and she would like, uh, you know, uh, there was a time where I, I was trying to be a little bit like, treat, talk, treat her like she's a kid. So I'm like trying to give her like directions other than what I, exactly what I want. Saying that, oh, you know, your 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 father is not allowing you to go to school, so you're really upset about it. And she would just be like, but just tell me what you want me to do. And then I was like this, and she's like, okay, I'll do it. So she was so badass, but I realized through the entire shoot that there was one particular direction that was just not landing with her. And it was, your father is not going to let you go to school, and you're not happy about it. All the way till the last scene where she's supposed to be making rotis and she's very happy. She's making the most perfect rotis. She's like belting them out one after the other. The dough is getting over. Yeah. <laughs> and it was in a conversation during that scene with her that I realized that the reason that direction was not landing was because she's actually not going to school. And mm -hmm. I had, without realizing it, ended up casting someone who was very very close to what my character really was her family had also recently come from the village she also has i think four younger sisters and even her youngest sibling is a brother and she also wasn't allowed to go to school so that she can kind of become the parent caretaker of her younger siblings and that was it was really heartbreaking uh but she's very bright <laughs> It's, I mean, she clearly is incredibly talented and was so captivating to watch, but I also felt like this cast was so well-rounded out. I think as a creative, you put so much into the prep for this project. And I'm curious, like, how did you find them and how did it feel kind of handing over 
the, your like your trust in a way to you know this ensemble who's who really makes it all click into place and come to life i think uh casting for this film was one of the things that i was most afraid of because it was so varied and there were so many different very specific kind of characters that had to be cast and i'm incredibly lucky that we found so like just the right people for it and i think they are the ones who came in and and you know breathed life into the the characters that we had written in on paper and made them so real um we made the decision to actually not have a casting director on this project and it was the team uh, and the independent film community at large uh, in india coming together and helping us out with finding the right characters um minu the little girl um we found her under my aunt's building because she was just my aunt's neighbor her mother uh, <laughs> is my uh, our driver's neighbor um then sarang uh, sati there's an incredible marathi filmmaker who uh, recommended trupti khamkar and Sh- shrikant yadav who came from the marathi regional cinema background um then we brought in mukesh pachori from bhopal we brought in somnath mandal from bengal um and of course milo sunka who plays simi she's an actor from arunachal pradesh so it was really people bring it was a mix of actors and non actors but um the even the actors are from various parts of the country and special love and shout out to vicky shinde and uh, her her group of uh, of trans women who i think i had done a, an advertising project with her uh, that where for whatever reason it couldn't come out and i remember making a promise to myself that the next project i do she's going to be in it because she's incredible and she's so striking and also when you're having a conversation about abuse and it's set in um, a police station how can you not acknowledge what the trans community in india goes through especially the hijra community especially from the hands of the people who are meant to protect us so it was really important for me to write them in and also give them the agency and the power in that dynamic um so yeah it was i think casting was really fun um also pushpendra singh who plays the the other bystander who comes in with them is actually a director he's an amazing independent filmmaker so i think it was the most heartwarming part of this was just how the independent film community in in bombay and in india banded together and just said okay we got you let's do this together yeah and i feel like you know you all came together to create something so phenomenal how did it can you tell me about what the journey this film has been on since you've kind of you know put it in a in a dropbox link and sent it out like <laughs> where, like what yes. has this what festivals has this film seen where is it going and you know what what's that journey been like so we premiered at sundance which was amazing i owe so much to them Premier, for their phenomenal. you know <laughs> and it's it's, it's our second sundance premiere so who were i think very very much qualified as sundance kids right now um, <laughs> and since then uh, it's been to over 50 festivals we won over 34 awards and it was through one of these awards that uh, we, we won the golden chair for best international short film at the norwegian short film festival and that's what qualified us for the academy awards and has propelled us into this beautiful beautiful overwhelming journey so uh, i think what's been really exciting is that it's just allowed us to have so many conversations about the film with so many people um we're having this conversation right now because uh, uh we're in consideration of course and even without thinking of what may or may not happen i'm just really happy that it's allowing us to amplify both the voices and the faces of the people who've been a part of making this film a reality um but also it's allowing us to amplify the conversations that we're trying to have in nocturnal burger on a big global stage now i have to my my last question for you is um 
you know, as a, the audience, you know, has been an active participant in your script, how can we be an active participant in your journey? Um, this FYC campaign has really been a grassroots uh, movement and it really is a powerful and moving 24 minutes. So please tell us how we can get involved. Yes. So, our, I mean, we are an independent short and we really have, I mean, we, we have no big PR machinery and big marketing monies behind us. And our approach has always been community first. So we've just been, you know, having very personal conversations, having hosting small, intimate community screenings and uh, the the houses of friends and uh, and in you know uh, little community spaces. And what we really want to do going forward is actually um, do a lot of impact screenings, work with a lot of NGOs, and see how this film can really be used to make a difference on ground. Um, but in terms of audiences and audience support, please talk about us. Please talk to us. Please uh, spread the good word. And uh, yeah, let's make a lot of noise so we can all be heard louder. Rima, thank you so much for talking with me today. And thank you all so much for tuning in and checking this out. Uh, remember, like Rima just said, watch it, talk about it, share it with someone. Um, this film only uh, gets going from word of mouth and you guys make a bigger difference than you know in your own communities. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.